think it is more than appropriate on our fifth anniversary, being this special occasion, to really give a loud round of applause to Dr. Frank Bird for the way he's developed this council over the past five years. We've been very privileged due to Frank's management to have outstanding speakers over the last five years, and tonight we're really capping ourselves off with Dr. Waldheim. We're very privileged to have Dr. Kurt Waldheim with us this evening. Dr. Waldheim has an extremely distinguished diplomatic career over the past 40 years, rising to the top diplomatic post of his country as Austrian foreign minister. Dr. Waldheim is best known to us and the world over for his 10 years of highly respected leadership as Secretary General of the United Nations from 1972 to 1982. Until recently, Dr. Waldheim was Research Professor for di uh, Diplomacy at Georgetown University, and he is informing tonight that he will be running for the Presidency of Austria next year. <clears throat> Confidence is essential in the conduct of diplomacy among both the greater and lesser powers. Dr. Waldheim will describe and develop this intriguing topic this evening when he speaks to us on the crisis of confidence in international relations. It is with the greatest pleasure that I introduce Dr. Kurt Waldheim. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Bolton, for your very kind words of introduction. Uh, I also wish uh, to thank uh, Mr. Bird, Frank Bird, for uh, inviting me to this uh, meeting. Uh, we were in contact, I think, uh, for the last uh, uh, two years, uh, uh, but unfortunately it didn't work out. But uh, now, finally, we found uh, the right occasion, and I feel very honored that you invited me on this important occasion, the fifth anniversary of uh, the Council of Foreign Affairs of Baltimore. Um, well, uh, on the way from the airport here, the charming lady who uh, picked me up at the airport asked me whether I know Baltimore. I said, yes, uh, a little. Uh, and when she insisted to find out where it was, I said, well, I had a checkup in the Johns Hopkins <laughs> <laughs> Hospital. <laughs> Fortunately, it was a routine checkup, and that was 25 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, um, this gathering here is uh, a very nice occasion for me to renew uh, friendships. I uh, have a number of friends here in this uh, city, uh, but it reminds me also something else. Uh, my first appearance as Secretary General on a social occasion uh, not far from here in New York City. It was one of those uh, big dinner parties uh, uh, in the great ballroom. And after I had finished my speech, uh, a lady came to the rostra, um, to the podium, and uh, apparently wanted to congratulate me. And she said, thank you, Mr. Secretary General. Uh, your speech was simply superfluous. <laughs> so, so I was a little taken aback, uh, but I noticed that the lady uh, didn't master the English language. So I wanted to find out, and I said, uh, well, thank you very much. Do you think my speech should be published posthumously? <laughs> <laughs> she said, yes, sir, the sooner the better. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <clears throat> well, uh, my dear friends, uh, I think uh, the timing of uh, my speech here tonight uh, uh, couldn't uh, have been chosen uh, better, not only because it is uh, the fifth anniversary. Can you hear me? Yes. 
Oh, I'm sorry, I'm too tall probably, <laughs> doesn't matter. Um, uh, not only because uh, it is the fifth anniversary of your organization, uh, but also because uh, the international situation is developing in a new direction. Although this is not uh, recognized by in certain quarters, uh, but I believe in some aspects, some new aspects of the international uh, development. What is the situation and what are the two great challenges? Well, one is uh, the East-West relationship and here especially the relationship between the two superpowers, your own great country and uh, the Soviet Union. And the other challenge is uh, the North-South relationship, which is uh, not very good, to say the least. I will talk about this later, but let me first talk about the first aspect of the international situation, the East-West relationship. And this, of course, in connection with some uh, new developments. One is uh, uh, the resumed uh, disarmament negotiations in uh, Geneva, and the other is uh, uh, the access uh, to power in Moscow of uh, Mr. Gorbachev. I think uh, uh, Gorbachev is a man who wants to resume, to reopen the dialogue with the Western world, and especially with the United States. Uh, last summer, Mrs. Thatcher the British Prime Minister spent uh, part of her vacation in Austria and I visited her. I know her from my official visits to London. And we talked about uh, the visit of Mr. Gorbachev. Perhaps you remember he was visiting London and uh, Mrs. Thatcher was very much impressed by him. Uh, she uh, said something which I uh, find very uh, um, important. Uh, she said that Although we in the Western world reject the Marxist ideology, we reject communism, but uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, this is a fact of life. We in the Western world, we cannot believe that we uh, can impose our ideology on other people, as they have no right to do that as far as the Western world is, uh, world is concerned. And uh, I think this is, she said with a few words, uh, what is indeed the great problem of our time, uh, that uh, both sides feel that the other side is bad. Remember uh, the public diplomacy uh, during the last couple of years when one side called the other names and uh, uh, rhetoric was uh, uh, the main element in international affairs. That doesn't solve anything. If you call the other side, you are an evil empire, and the other side calls you, you, uh, you are the same or something similar. Uh, we have seen that in the Pravda and in other papers, and we have seen what was said here. I mention this only to explain to you that this kind of diplomacy cannot succeed. Let's get back to quiet diplomacy, to the traditional diplomacy, uh, both sides have excellent diplomats and they can uh, convey to each other what they want and in what way they want to negotiate. But of course, uh, in a Western democracy, you need public support and therefore you have to make statements uh, in order to uh, get that kind of support from the public. Uh, leaders in the Western world want to be re-elected and therefore they always try to uh, do something which they feel the public uh, wants them to do and wants them to say. It's easy, of course, in uh, Marxist uh, uh, regimes, uh, uh, they don't have this kind of public opinion. But still, the basic problem remains the same, uh, that we have to get away from uh, this uh, public uh, acrimonious exchange uh, of uh, accusations we have to get back uh, to quiet uh, diplomacy. Now, I have the impression that uh, with uh, the new leader in the Soviet Union, there is a chance. Of course, and I have to give you immediately a warning, uh, 
Uh, if I read the papers here and in other Western countries, in Western Europe, um, people are getting somewhat impatient. They, they, they believe that now something has to change immediately. The change won't come immediately. This man, the new man, who Gorbachev, uh, he is part of a collective leadership. And uh, in this position, he has to operate very carefully. Uh, there was only one Soviet leader after the Second World War who deviated from that principle of uh, collective leadership, and that was Khrushchev. Uh, he neglected uh, consultations with uh, the Politburo. He often ignored the collective leadership and made his own decisions. And that led to his downfall. As you know, he left the, uh, the government in disgrace. Uh, and the main reason for this is that he ignored that basic principle. Now, as far as I can judge, uh, Gorbachev is a highly intelligent man. He wants an opening up towards the Western world. He wants the resumption of uh, the dialogue. He is not burdened with the terrible experience of the old generation in the Soviet Union because of the war. These old men, they still suffer under this uh, phenomenon. Gorbachev doesn't belong to that generation. He is freer. He is perhaps more relaxed. Uh, and uh, what we have to wait and see, of course, is whether he will establish himself as the real leader of the country, despite the collective leadership which exists in the Soviet Union. But uh, we should give him a chance. I think uh, it isn't helpful if we criticize him immediately and say, well, what you say is the good old story in connection with uh, disarmament or arms control negotiations in Geneva. Now that brings me immediately to that uh, aspect of the international situation and uh, uh, the East-West uh, contacts. Uh, uh, I welcome, as you all do, I'm sure that the talks in Geneva were resumed in January. But here again, I do not expect an, e an easy and a, a quick uh, solution. I do not expect a breakthrough in the near future, certainly not in this present round of negotiations. It will take years, five, ten years, before we can expect a, a real breakthrough and an, a solid agreement uh, on arms control. Why? Well, the positions of the two sides are very different, far apart. The United States wants to discuss in the first place, and they said it publicly, uh, the, the question of deployment uh, and production uh, limitation of uh, missiles in Europe, the medium range uh, or intermediate range uh, uh, nuclear missiles, and the strategic missiles. Whereas uh, the Russians want uh, to concentrate on the new uh, space initiative of President Reagan. They are deadly afraid of that new initiative for two reasons. One is uh, that uh, the Americans, your scientists, are apparently uh, far ahead in uh, the research concerning outer space uh, defense problems, and secondly, uh, the financial implications. This is an extremely expensive undertaking. I talked recently with a, with a scientist, an American scientist, who just came back from Rome, where he was a member of the advisory board of the Pope on scientific matters, and he told me that uh, scientists, at least the group to which he, or to whom he belonged, uh, doesn't expect uh, um, a result, a concrete result of the research in this field before 20 to 30 years. Now, what does that mean? In the meantime, the production of offensive weapons will continue. So what we will have is a two-tier approach. You will continue with the production of uh, uh, nuclear missiles. Uh, and on the other hand, you will work on the research uh, concerning uh, the outer space uh, defense uh, system, uh, the so-called 
staff or approach. Well, I per I'm personally skeptical about this uh, new approach. Uh, I feel that apart from uh, the scientific and financial implications, uh, it will create a further escalation of the arms race. Because you see, we are always inclined to think uh, that uh, we are ahead of this or that uh, nation in regard uh, of our preparedness for a future uh, military confrontation. But what happens usually is that if you start to produce new weapons, the other side is doing exactly the same. And we cannot expect that if a decision were made uh, that uh, the research and development uh, in regard uh, to uh, the space defense system, uh, if we, if we uh, uh, pro if we were able to produce uh, such a system, uh, the Russians will certainly do the same. And the argument that uh, their economy is so weak that they just can't afford to do that is very naive. Uh, I can tell you from a long experience uh, in negotiations with uh, the Soviets uh, that they will certainly uh, make uh, many efforts and sacrifices in order uh, to achieve uh, uh, parity with uh, the United States in this regard. Uh, therefore, I do not think uh, that uh, we should uh, uh, believe uh, that if one side starts with such a new development, that the other side will not do the same. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, having said this um, about the East-West relationship, uh, I feel I should refer to one of the consequences of uh, this uh, development, namely uh, uh, the regional conflicts uh, which uh, we are facing today. Unfortunately, in those last uh, 40 years since the end of the Second World War, numerous regional uh, bilateral conflicts have taken place. Uh, in the different parts of the world. Uh, some could be resolved, uh, uh, others, the majority unfortunately not. Uh, we are still faced with a very explosive situation in the Middle East, in Central America, in Afghanistan, in Southern Africa. And uh, the East-West tension uh, makes it much more difficult to find solutions, to work out solutions for those regional conflicts, because both sides have their friends, uh, their clients, if you like to call them this way. And look what happens in the Middle East. The United States supports Israel, uh, the Russians uh, support Syria, and other uh, more radical Arabs uh, uh, like Libya or the PLO. So, it is evident uh, that uh, this East-West uh, confrontation, which prevails, uh, makes it much more difficult to work out solutions for such problems. I hope that uh, the new initiative, which uh, has been taken recently by some of the moderate Arabs, uh, like King Hussein and uh, President Mubarak of Egypt, uh, will be picked up uh, uh, in Washington and in other capitals, uh, because I really feel uh, that uh, this may open the door for a new round of negotiations. Of course, we should not expect that that will immediately solve the problem. And incidentally, what they propose is very similar to uh, the proposal which uh, President Reagan made more than two years ago. Uh, uh, and uh, I think uh, that the United States has to carry this responsibility. It is absolutely important uh, that uh, the United States lends its goods offices uh, to the parties in conflict in order to work out a solution. I do understand the hesitation uh, in Washington in this regard because uh, after, during and after the negotiations concerning um, the withdrawal of foreign forces from Lebanon, which took place under the auspices of Secretary Schulz, the uh, painfully worked out uh, uh, agreement uh, didn't work. Uh, 
Syria rejected to cooperate and the whole uh, effort broke down. I do understand that this is a frustrating experience, uh, ladies and gentlemen, but that should not mean that we should not make another effort, and I really hope that uh, um, Washington will seize this opportunity. These are moderate Arab leaders, uh, Egypt and uh, um, Jordan, and uh, I think uh, uh, that it is worth to look into this matter, not to reject it, to examine uh, these uh, new aspects carefully and to see whether a new uh, effort uh, can be made in order to get us out of the present stalemate. Of course, the question uh, turns always around the Palestinian issue, and one will have to find a solution for that. In my opinion, the problem can only be solved if both principles are recognized, as they are contained in Resolution 242 of the United Nations Security Council. The right of Israel to exist in secure and recognized boundaries, on the one hand, and the right, uh, the legitimate uh, rights of the Palestinians. I think this is uh, the balance which has to be achieved, and if uh, this new effort uh, helps uh, to uh, bring us nearer uh, to uh, such uh, a recognition, then I think we will have a chance uh, to make progress and hopefully find a reasonable uh, solution, for comprehensive solution for this problem. Ladies and gentlemen, I could continue now to talk to you about the war between Iran and Iraq and the situation in Namibia. You heard this morning again the latest news from South Africa. Uh, I could talk to you about Central America. I don't want uh, to go too far here because it would uh, go far beyond uh, the purpose of uh, uh, my speech. Let me just say this. As far as Iran and Iraq is concerned, uh, the two parties don't want, apparently, uh, to start negotiations. Uh, the atmosphere is so emotional. I discussed it with my successor. I saw him this morning in New York, and he just came back from uh, visits uh, to Tehran and uh, to uh, Baghdad. And uh, he confirmed to me what I felt, that uh, the emotions are still so high, uh, both sides are not ready to make the necessary concessions in order to stop the fighting <coughs> and to start negotiations. And my conclusion is this. The war will go on for mainly two reasons. One, uh, the Western world has enough oil and doesn't have to intervene in order to get that oil from that area. There are enough reserves uh, in the Western world today. We learned our lesson. And secondly, the parties in conflict have enough money to buy new weapons and to do it and they get enough weapons from the Western world, from the East Bloc countries, and uh, therefore the war will go on and will not uh, be finished in the near future. It will be a war of attrition, and only if and when both sides are exhausted, then there may be a chance uh, that they start uh, negotiations to achieve a peaceful solution. As far as uh, Central America is concerned, I do not hesitate to tell you that I consider uh, this uh, a very dangerous uh, development, and I'm convinced that it can only be resolved uh, uh, through a political uh, solution. And uh, I welcome the efforts of uh, the uh, so-called Contatora group. I think these people try to do their best. Uh, it hasn't uh, produced a solution until now. Uh, but I think we should give them another chance in order to work out a political settlement acceptable to all sides. Well, I talked uh, about the political situation in the world, the East-West relationship. Uh, I talked about uh, some aspects of uh, uh, regional wars, conflicts, etc. But uh, the picture of the world uh, wouldn't be complete if I didn't tell you a little bit about uh, the other aspect of the international crisis situation, and that is uh, the economic development. And here, of course, I'm not talking only about uh, the problems we in the Western world have, you in your own country, although there is 
uh, a recovery which is welcomed by all of us in the Western world, it hasn't reached Europe. They are still suffering tremendously under unemployment, the highest since World War II, and it has certainly not reached the third world. And I'm not sure how long the American uh, recovery will last. Now that brings me, of course, uh, to the question of the North-South relationship. And here I have to say uh, that uh, we should not underestimate the importance of stability in the third world. There are people saying, well, these people, they, if they can't uh, manage their own affairs, why should we all the time help them, uh, give them assistance? Uh, uh, we have enough problems. We have unemployment. Uh, uh, we have uh, budget deficits and so on. Let's first solve our own problems and then we will see what happens uh, uh, with the third world. This is wrong. Uh, I do not hesitate to say to, that we are already, we in the Western world, are today already prisoners of the third world because uh, we are sitting all in the same boat. And if the third world goes under, we in the North will go under too. And I refer here especially to the question of debts. Uh, as you are fully aware, uh, the third world has debts of uh, over $800 billion. And uh, the only four Latin American countries, Brazil, Argentina, Mexico, and Venezuela, have debts of over $200 billion and they can't pay that back, not under the present uh, circumstances. Uh, the Monetary Fund, the World Bank, um, uh, and individual governments have uh, made great efforts to help them overcoming this problem. But uh, uh, those ad hoc measures uh, do not solve the problem. What we really have to do is to work out uh, a new uh, approach to these problems, a comprehensive new settlement of the debt question, because otherwise we will have trouble. Um, and uh, I think uh, that uh, we are facing a, a vicious circle uh, in this regard. The NOAAs, the industrialized countries, are trying to help the South in the best possible way, despite their problems. But if and when those third world countries uh, have developed their economy, when they are able to export their products, which they did produce with the help of the North, the industrialized countries in the North uh, adopt protectionist measures so that those third world countries can't export their manufactured and other articles and don't get the hard currency which they need in order to pay back their debts. As I uh, said before, this is a tremendous burden for them, uh, definitely for the time being and for the near, next, for the near future. They are unable uh, to pay back the principles. What we try at least is that they will pay back uh, the interests. Uh, the former Argentine president, Frontisi, uh, who is a member of the International uh, Commission, which I have the honor to chair since last year. It's a group of former heads of state and former prime ministers, and Frontisi is one of them. He told me uh, in this connection uh, the following. He said, the fact alone that uh, the interest rates in this country uh, were raised by half a percentage point meant for Argentina that for the current year, they had to pay $600 million more of interest than they had in their, foreseen in their budget. And he put the provocative question to me, now how do you think that we can solve our problems if we suddenly are faced with a situation which we couldn't expect before and uh, half, over half a billion dollars is a considerable amount of money uh, for the budget of a developing country. Um, of course, uh, the uh, International Monetary Fund in Washington tells these countries, you will get further help, but only if you tighten your belt and if you reorganize your economy so that 
we see a chance for you that you solve your economic and financial problems. That's a sound approach. But one shouldn't overdo it, because what we have seen in this collection is that a number of developing countries have tried to do that. In some uh, cases, it worked, like in Mexico. Uh, in others, like the Dominican Republic, it did not work. There was an uprising. There was almost a revolution, because the, pre the, the price, the support of the, pre uh, the prices for uh, basic uh, food uh, stuff like bread and other um, important uh, food stuff uh, had to be um, uh, stopped. Uh, otherwise, they couldn't have uh, um, uh, consolidated their financial situation. But that again meant that the poorer people had to pay more for bread, butter, and for everything else they bought. So uh, we, the International Monetary Fund has to steer a very careful course in order not to uh, create a situation which may be uh, counterproductive to uh, the interests which we all have, namely that they stabilize their, uh, their economy and that they are then finally able to pay back their debts. Another aspect of the economic situation. Uh, I give you a few figures. Um, we in the North always believe that whatever we do with the South is a sort of charity. Ladies and gentlemen, this is not true. It is not a charity anymore. It has been perhaps uh, at the very beginning after the war, but now uh, this help is given uh, for reasons of self-interest. Uh, because, as I said before, if we don't make sure that the third world survives, we will have a lot of trouble. And um, uh, for instance, in this country, the United uh, States, 50% uh, of uh, the exports of the third world, not including the OPEC countries, uh, is going to the United States, 50%. And uh, five million jobs in the United States are supported by exports to developing countries. And the situation is very similar in Western Europe. I mention these figures because it shows how interlinked, how interrelated the economies of the North and the South are, and how important it is that we do cooperate and that we make sure uh, that these countries in the South uh, get the necessary a cooperation from us in order to maintain international economic stability. I am therefore very pleased that uh, your administration has recently proposed a new round of trade negotiations, international trade uh, negotiations, which uh, will uh, hopefully begin uh, soon. The French government has uh, suggested to link uh, such trade negotiations with monetary negotiations, because they are deeply worried, not only the French, but also many other Western European countries, about the strong dollar and the deficit in the United States. Uh, and uh, they want to create some, the French and a number of other Europeans want to create something similar as Bretton Woods, which was helpful after the war, but then it became superseded by other developments. But now, with the floating dollars and the insecurity uh, in, in the monetary field, especially the French government wants to link negotiations on the monetary issues with trade negotiations. But the positive aspect in this whole affair is that there everybody recognizes that new negotiations on trade and monetary questions are necessary in order to get us out of the present dilemma. There is one very positive development in international affairs, and that is the fact that uh, many uh, developing countries are beginning to recognize uh, the principles of a free market economy. I think this is a, a very important, dramatic development which we should not underestimate. The most important example for this is China, as you are all fully aware, under Deng Xiaoping. Uh, the Chinese uh, People's Republic 
despite being a communist country, has accepted uh, a number of principles concerning uh, the market economy because they recognize that only in this way it's possible for them uh, to recover, to develop their economy, and to modernize uh, their um, economic uh, situation. But it is not only uh, China uh, which is doing uh, this. We see similar developments in Africa uh, where those uh, former colonies realize more and more that the planned economy, which they had originally exclusively in their countries, that Marxist approaches to their economy hasn't solved their problems. The tribal system isn't really um, interested in this kind of approach. Uh, it's more interested in uh, uh, a market economy. And you see now more and more in those countries, uh, whether it's uh, Egypt, whether it's Somalia, whether it is Central Africa from Senegal, with the exception of Ethiopia, of course, those smaller countries, they are more and more tending to the Western world uh, because they realized that their economy, their economic principles uh, are better for them, uh, have a better chance to solve their economic problems than planned economy alone. So what they are doing now is a sort of combination between market economy and a certain degree of planned economy. But these are new developments, ladies and gentlemen, and we should not underestimate them. You see, I'm always surprised when I uh, hear and read in the papers and in the media, of course, well, uh, the developing countries are more and more absorbed by communist ideology and are turning away from the Western world. This is not true. I have seen these countries, I have visited them, and I assure you that uh, the trend is rather in the other direction. And uh, I think if the Western world recognizes this and helps these countries, these people, these governments, uh, the Western world has a good chance to attract them and uh, uh, to make sure that these countries uh, cooperate in a constructive way with the Western world. Uh, incidentally, maybe some of you come from uh, Eastern Europe uh, talking about uh, principles of market economy. The one country in Eastern Europe which is uh, uh, recognized as being uh, the most constructive uh, uh, communist country, uh, and uh, the one where the economy is best developed is Hungary. And uh, the reason is that they have accepted quietly, silently, uh, principles of a market economy. Uh, there is, again, the possibility to own property. Uh, they don't talk much about it, uh, but if you visit that country, you will see the difference. Uh, they did realize uh, that uh, this is for them the only way to get out of the terrible situation they were in after the revolution in 56. And their communist leader, Kada, is a realist and he permits this development. And Moscow doesn't really object to it because they feel as long as they don't break out of uh, their zone of influence, uh, why not permitting them to develop their own approach to those economic problems? These are all interesting uh, developments. Uh, and uh, I think sometimes uh, we in the Western world forget this or overlook it. But this is a trend which is highly interesting and which may later on lead to a, a more positive development in East-West relations than uh, we usually think. Now, finally, before I conclude, uh, let me uh, say a few words about the United Nations. Since I was its Secretary General for 10 years, you will ask the question, and what did the UN do in this situation? You told us now so many things about the East-West relationship, about uh, the North-South problems, but where is the United Nations in this picture? Well, let me say this. Looking back, uh, to uh, uh, those uh, 40 years of the United Nations existence, uh, 
I think uh, that uh, all in all, it hasn't done a bad job. I am the first one to recognize that it has many shortcomings, many failures, uh, mistakes were made, uh, but governments too make mistakes, not only the United Nations. So why should we be uh, so critical uh, towards uh, in, uh, an international organization? The mistake, in my opinion, which was made and which is the reason for the weakness of the Security Council, for the failure of the United Nations uh, to intervene successfully in so many conflicts is an assumption, a ro the wrong assumption of the founding fathers uh, that whenever there is danger in the world, whenever there is a conflict, the big powers, the so-called permanent members of the Security Council will immediately get together, will iron out the difficulties and will decide in the Security Council uh, measures which will stop fighting and which will restore peace. Now that was a rather naive assumption because the ink on the paper of the Charter wasn't even dry yet when the Cold War broke out, the blockade of Berlin and other uh, negative developments and the United Nations was paralyzed. With one exception, in the whole history, where the Security Council could take effective measures, and it was during the Korean War, when uh, uh, the Soviet Union left the Council and the other members uh, of the Council decided to set up an international force which was sent to Korea, and uh, uh, the problem was uh, uh, not solved, but the uh, invasion of uh, North Korea was stopped. And in this way, the Security Council could act effectively. But this never happened uh, again. Later on, uh, peacekeeping forces were uh, created on the uh, proposal of Lester Pearson, uh, the former Prime Minister of Canada. Uh, but the, uh, a peacekeeping force is not a fighting force. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is a police force which uh, creates, which establishes buffer zones and which uh, tries to maintain calm and order in a certain area so that the negotiating process can continue, but nothing more. So if there is a military attack against peacekeeping forces of the United Nations who have only, who carry only light weapons, they have neither artillery nor other heavy weapons, nothing. They have just uh, rifles and pistols, so they cannot really uh, be considered uh, to be uh, a fighting force, but they are playing a very useful role. What is forgotten again and again is that it is not only the political work of the United Nations which is important, but the work done in the economic and social field. 80% of the budget of the United Nations goes to that work of the United Nations, the economic and social work. All those uh, specialized agencies like UNICEF, uh, uh, FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization, uh, trying to help uh, starving people all over the world, uh, refugees especially, the High Commissioner for Refugees, his office, his uh, staff, um, uh, the World Health Organization, which has uh, uh, eradicated smallpox and is now in the process of eradicating malaria and other illnesses. Uh, it is this aspect of the work of the United Nations which is usually uh, overlooked but it, which is uh, so important, I dare to say, indispensable. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I do not believe uh, that uh, we will uh, have a nuclear war uh, between uh, the superpowers. Uh, although they have 95% uh, of all nuclear weapons in their hands, 95%, but they won't go to a nuclear war. I'm personally convinced uh, that uh, they will, they are fully aware of the consequences of uh, such a confrontation. They know uh, that uh, such a war cannot be won. And uh, I'm therefore quite hopeful that we will avoid it. What worries me much more is uh, the fact that we are still facing so many regional conflicts
I mentioned to some of them, I mentioned some of them a moment ago. And here I see the real uh, danger, not only this one or that one or the other smaller country which has the weapon or will have the atomic weapon in the future may use it in a desperate situation. And the other reason uh, for my deep concern is that uh, in one way or the other, sooner or later, if we do not solve these problems, uh, the uh, big powers will get involved in such a confrontation. And then the danger of a big power confrontation is very real. This is the reason why I insist so much that we should make every effort to find solutions for those regional conflicts, for those smaller wars, if you like to call them this way, because it's not only the tragic experience in such wars, but also the consequences and dangers for all mankind, for all of us, if we were unable to solve them. Ladies and gentlemen, I have tried uh, uh, to give you a frank and unambiguous picture of the international situation. I have uh, described uh, some of the more important problems uh, we are facing today. I do not wish to minimize uh, these problems, uh, but I believe it is within our power to solve them. We have the resources and we have uh, the ability. What uh, we need is the political will and the courage to break with past practices and to deal with the great issues of our time in a global perspective. This is the only road to peace. I thank you. What are your views about the amendment of the United Nations Charter? Well, I'm not very optimistic about this because uh, my feeling is that we wouldn't get a better charter today than we got in 1945. Uh, uh, you see, uh, one of the discouraging elements in international affairs today is that uh, governments are turning away from internationalism, from multilateral diplomacy, returning to the old-fashioned uh, um, diplomacy, bilateral diplomacy, to nationalism. Sometimes we see even signs of chauvinism. Why? Because after the war, uh, most of the governments were still under the shock of the terrible experience of the Second World War. And therefore they accepted uh, the Charter of the United Nations. Uh, they accepted uh, to give up uh, uh, some of their sovereign rights. Uh, in favor of an international authority, which should be the United Nations. Um, today they wouldn't do that. Uh, and I remember uh, that at that time there was also the question of the veto power. And uh, we know that this is a problem. Uh, I don't think the, uh, we, the, the big powers, uh, perhaps with the exception of China, they told me once uh, they would be ready to give up the veto power, but n nobody else. Uh, of the five uh, big powers would uh, do that. Uh, so at that time, in 1945, it was uh, one of the conditions of uh, the big powers uh, to accept the charter uh, that they get uh, the veto power in order to control uh, the United Nations uh, and to control uh, developments in international affairs. Now, you speak about amendments. Uh, I understand uh, your question very well. In, in fact, I was once uh, chairing a, a committee, a, a charter review committee, uh, before I became Secretary General. And I can tell you, uh, not much came out of it, not because I chaired it. <laughs> there was no willingness. Uh, there was no willingness uh, on the part of the membership uh, uh, to change the chart. Uh, of course, uh, the smaller ones, uh, the middle-sized countries, uh, including my own, were all in favor of changing certain things. But uh, the bigger ones, uh, they didn't like that. Uh, 
You see, the small countries are coming to the United Nations, trying to get help, uh, uh, pleading with the United Nations, as they did so often when I was there as Secretary General. Why don't you do more? Why can't you help us in a better way? Uh, they need the United Nations, and they should really support it better than they do, because uh, sometimes I have my doubts whether uh, uh, certain approaches by uh, middle-sized uh, and smaller countries are right uh, in uh, getting uh, solutions of the problems. Uh, there's too, too much emotion involved. Uh, but the big powers, they don't really need the United Nations. They can defend themselves alone. And therefore, we have to make sure, uh, and this is, of course, something, it's an appeal almost. I am making again and again now to my friends uh, in those smaller countries, middle-sized countries, I say, be careful, don't overdo it. Uh, uh, it doesn't really solve a problem if you repeat acrimonious attacks again and again every year in the General Assembly. The Assembly has no executive power. It cannot make decisions. It's the Security Council under the Charter which makes decisions. So we should uh, be more realistic in the United Nations, more pragmatic, uh, uh, more sitting down and talking to each other, negotiating, and get away from that public debate which uh, uh, doesn't really solve problems. Uh, and as I said, the big powers uh, uh, don't need the organization. Uh, they are powerful enough uh, uh, if they are attacked uh, to defend themselves. The little ones, they need uh, the organization badly and they should really approach this problem in a practical and perhaps more realistic way. Would you describe your feelings uh, about the Vietnam War in retrospect? Perhaps your view of what you perceive to be the American reaction uh, now to that war? Yeah, well, uh, uh, history has shown clearly that uh, it was a mistake uh, to have that war in Vietnam, that it would have been uh, much better to keep out of it, uh, that this was a problem we, which uh, couldn't and shouldn't have been uh, uh, resolved uh, through war. Uh, and I think many uh, negative developments as a consequence of the Vietnam War could have been avoided if uh, uh, your country hadn't been, uh, hadn't gotten involved in that war, uh, as the French learned their lesson when they were in Vietnam and finally uh, uh, had to get out. Uh, but I think there is another aspect uh, which I am sometimes surprised seeing here when I read uh, the papers here and uh, listen to the media. Um, I think uh, uh, the war is over, and uh, because of uh, the uh, lesson which uh, this great country has learned from the Vietnam War, uh, its image in Asia uh, is uh, improving in, an, in a most impressive way, as far as I can see. And I don't think that it helps very much if one uh, repeats again and again the pros and contras, was it right, was it wrong, etc. It's history now. My feeling is it was a mistake uh, to enter into that war. But now, look ahead, and I think this country has such a beautiful future, uh, and uh, its uh, positive aspects are recognized. Oh, uh, I remember coming from a country which was almost starving after the Second World War. We looked to your country for uh, help, and we got it through the Marshall Plan. This is something, in my opinion, which was the, uh, one of the greatest uh, uh, contributions to peace and international understanding. And you should be proud of this. There is no need always to, to have this defeatist <laughs> attitude. You have all reason to be proud. There are two questions. The first is, uh, will the need the, in a more complicated world for information force the Soviet Union to become more open to the rest of the world? And secondly, what policy should be followed by Japan and the Western world to help the third world? Well, as far as the first question is concerned, I think uh, uh, there are signs, uh, especially with uh, uh, the access of uh, um, Gorbachev uh, to uh, the new leadership uh, in uh, the Soviet Union, uh, that uh, 
they will uh, be more flexible. This is my personal opinion. I think uh, there's a great interest uh, to do that. Of course, you can't force them to do it. That would be the wrong method, the wrong approach. Uh, it has to come by itself under the impression of uh, the developments in the rest of the world. But I'm, I'm confident uh, that it will come. Uh, we have to have patience. It won't come overnight, but it will come. And incidentally, uh, if you want uh, to uh, please uh, the young generation or young people in the Soviet Union just sent them blue jeans. That is what they like best. <laughs> well, as far as the uh, second question is concerned, uh, well, uh, of course, uh, uh, Japan and Europe uh, should uh, uh, get involved in, in a better uh, program, in a more uh, effective, uh, constructive uh, assistance program for the third world. Uh, I think uh, there's no doubt in my mind that what is done by uh, the Europeans and by Japan in this regard is not uh, enough. Uh, and uh, I think uh, uh, we should uh, make clear to them uh, that uh, more has to be done in this regard. Incidentally, this is one aspect which we discuss in my commission. We have next week in Paris our uh, meeting, and this is uh, definitely on the agenda of our conference. Mr. Secretary General, it has been an honor for us to have you with us. We appreciate the world view that you've presented, your eminent good sense. Uh, we appreciate it very much.